let me share my let me share my screen. So as I said today, we're going to try to move and you know transition from uh, the classical period, the ancient period in philosophy, uh, to the modern period. Descartes, he's the next philosopher we're covering. We're going to read his uh, Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, so if you haven't yet, uh, for next meeting, you better have read the first meditation because we'll be we'll begin class pretty much right at the beginning of the reading. Uh, so today though, what I wanna do is just provide us with some historical background on Descartes. Well, not really even Descartes. Uh, we, we, we might not even get to him too much. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit about him, uh, but mainly it's kind of setting up the background, the, the, the context, you know, the, 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 the history uh, that he was immersed in. And, and, and that'll, I think, give you a better understanding of the reading. I find that you know some students when they read this med the meditations for the first time, they're they're struck at his skepticism, the fact that he doubts so much, and they can't quite understand why does why is he so doubtful. <laughs> um, I think when you hear the lecture today and hear me explain sort of the time period uh, in which he's sort of coming of age, hopefully that you won't have as much of a reaction like that. So. I said that we're moving from the classical period to the modern period in philosophy. Uh, Descartes is often referred to as the father of modern philosophy. And there's quite a few, uh, you know, people who cringe to hear that. They don't like that title. They don't think he deserves to be called the father of modern philosophy, but it's, it's stuck. Okay. And um, this is a bit confusing for students than the term modern in this context, because Descartes died in, in the year 1650. So, you know, most people, when they hear the word modern, they think like right now, you know, contemporary, the modern world. Um, but in philosophy, when we say modern, when we're talking about the modern period in philosophy, uh, especially when you hear the word early modern, we're talking about anything after the scientific revolution. So a big part of what we're going to talk about today is the scientific revolution, what was it, what was it about, um, and, and this is, you're going to see after the scientific revolution starts to really take hold of Europe, it has a big impact on Western philosophy, and so uh, that's the main focus today. Again, it's going to be a shorter lecture. I hope to get through this pretty quick, um, and then have some time at the end to talk about papers for any people that have questions about your essay that's due this weekend. So one feature that you might say about modern philosophy is that the focus tends to be on epistemology. So there's that word again, uh, epistemology. Uh, you could argue, uh, you'd have a pretty good basis for your argument. You could argue that, that the earlier Greek philosophy, the, 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 the classic ancient philosophy, was primarily focused on metaphysics. Uh, so remember metaphysics, is philosophy that deals with theories about reality. What's real? Uh, what is the fundamental nature of what is real? Uh, what is, you know, what is true? And these sort of questions. Plato uh, seemed to focus on a lot of things, but metaphysics seemed to be the most important thing. And in fact, Aristotle, who we'll talk a little bit about Aristotle today. Um, we're going to have to when we get to the scientific revolution. Uh, but Aristotle, they didn't use the word metaphysics. That wasn't even a word yet. But, but what we what we now call metaphysics, the philosophy dealing with you know overall theories of truth and reality, um, Aristotle referred to it as first philosophy, right? Metaphysics is first philosophy. So when you do when you do metaphysics, when you when you're answering questions about what the nature of all that is is, right? What, you know, how are things in the universe, and and, and what is their nature? That's the basics. That's the starting point. That's first philosophy. That's the fundamentals. And it seems like Plato, he never came out and said that, but if you look at his work, that seems to be his primary focus. So again, the ancient, the, the, the classical philosophy was focused on metaphysics, theories of reality. One feature of the modern period, it seems to be the shift is towards epistemology and away from metaphysics. Uh, who remembers? Does anybody here remember um, what is epistemology? So again, metaphysics, you're dealing with, with theories, uh, you know, about the nature of reality. Who remembers, what, what does the term epistemology refer to? 
I had question in the morals or somebody. This is a philosophy that we talked about on the very first day of class. Ethics, dealing with the right or wrong, metaphysics, dealing with the what is real, what is epistemology, what, what sort of questions do we ask in epistemology? Not all at once. You got your notes there, you can flip back to day one and look at your notes. You need to jot this down. I'm looking through my notes now. <laughs> It's like knowledge, the theory of knowledge. And like, with validity. Okay, yeah, Kalik, thank you. Um, correct. Uh, in the chat box, Kalik writes, epistemologists study the nature of knowledge. Good. So if you're, if you're a philosopher, an epistemologist, he's doing epistemology, right? <laughs> Very redundant to say that. Um, you're asking questions about knowledge. What is knowledge? What is the nature of knowledge? Um, you know, when you say you know something, what does that mean? Uh, what justifies your claim to knowing it's, something? It's like, and uh, you know, this is again, this is the big focus. And I think that's why, to me, uh, as much as I'm not a big fan of Descartes, I got to put my cards on the table right up front. Uh, I, I don't like his philosophy much. Uh, I have deep respect for the guy, he was a genius. Uh, don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, he, he's not my favorite, but I do think he kind of deserves the title, Father of Modern Philosophy, uh, because he seems to be the one that does kind of lead the way in this shift away from metaphysics towards questions about knowledge, away from questions about reality. and what's, It's not that he doesn't do metaphysics. You'll see when we get to meditations, there's a lot of metaphysics in there, but the meditations that's really the short title. The full title is Meditations on First Philosophy. Back to that term again, first philosophy. For Aristotle, first philosophy was metaphysics. But it seems like Descartes, his main concern is things of, you know, how do you know what you know? What is the, what is the basis for knowledge? And when we look at this time period, okay, the, the, the modern period in philosophy, there's more or less two fundamental approaches to epistemology and Descartes represents one of them. So when, when we ask the question about, you know, knowledge and where it comes from, where, you know, when you, when you know a fact, when you know something's true, where does that, where does that knowledge originate? Where does it come from? What is the basis for that knowledge? Experience. During the modern period, there developed these two schools of thought. Uh, that approach this question in different ways. The rationalist, represented by Descartes, for us, right? We're going to read De Descartes, so he'll be sort of our our representative for the rationalists. They claim that knowledge is always going to be based on reason. Your ability to use reason to understand concepts, and to use that understanding to guide yourself and to make judgments. So. Um, I can't hear you, Danielle. Were you trying to talk? I see that you're typing in the chat box. Did you, uh, it says you're muted. You need, need to unmute yourself. Uh, so, but um, is, is anybody else trying to talk and not being able to speak? And if Hello? you are, type in the chat box and let me know. I don't know what the deal is. Hello? Uh, anyway, so but back to what I was saying. Okay, so Descartes, remember, so they're both doing, they're both doing, a, both schools, the rationalist and on the right, you see the empiricist. They're both doing epistemology, but they have different answers to the question of where does knowledge come from? What is the basis for knowledge? And, um, oh, you know what? I know what the deal is. I know exactly what the deal is. Sorry. Hold on a second. A lot of people have, have been trying to talk, it looks like. Uh, my bad. I have my, I have my uh, speaker is unplugged. I had it turned off. So just give me a second. I'll replug it in. Hold on a second. Pardon me.
Okay. Let's see. Is that going to work? Hold on. All right. Could, could someone just speak real quick to test it? I want to see if it's working. Hey, okay. you? All right. Now, now I can hear you. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Now we're good. Now we're, now we're rocking. Okay, cool. So I bet a bunch of y'all were trying to answer my question earlier and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So, so, um, so let's see here. Uh, back to what I was saying with Descartes. Uh, so he's a rationalist. And so what that means is that as far as knowledge is concerned, um, it's always based on reason. Where does knowledge come from? How do you know the things you know? Uh, it's because you use your, your mind to understand concepts. You rationalize, you reason, and you're able to apply those concepts uh, in particular cases, make judgments about certain things. Okay. So that's the rationalist approach. And you got people like Descartes. Uh, there's another guy, Leibniz and Spinoza, two other philosophers who we, we might talk about later if we have time. You know, once we finish Descartes, I'm, I might mention them a bit. But on the other side of the aisle, right, we've got a different approach that says, wait a minute, no, like this is the empiricists. It's like, um, like you trying to justify like the difference between belief and opinion. Well, not exactly. Um, opinion and belief are typically seen as the same thing. They're just words. They're kind of the word, you know, it, two words for the same thing. At least in Plato, they are. Um, and there might be some other philosophers that distinguish between the two. Um, but um, we're talking about knowing. When you use the word belief or opinion, um, I, I would say that if you're if you're an epistemologist per se, you know, if you're somebody who's doing epistemology, one thing you need to distinguish actually is the difference between what you might call a belief or an opinion and something that you know. Yeah, and and someone like Plato might say, well, in order to know something, you have to believe it, but that's not enough, right? You can believe anything you want. You can believe that the tooth fairy exists. But that doesn't mean you know it. Uh, for Plato, it has to be true uh, in order to be knowledge. Okay, so that you know that's one example. Um, so you know that that distinction is important, but we haven't really brought that up yet, right? The main point is where does knowledge, whatever knowledge is, where does it come from? Like when you know something, where does it come from? Descartes says it comes from your mind, your reason, your ability to use your mind to reason about things. Now we get to the empiricists. Okay, the empiricists are going to say, "Look, of course you need reason, and that plays a role in your knowledge. But if you don't have something to reason about, there's no there's no knowledge." So, for someone like David Hume or John Locke, Barclay, they're all going to say that knowledge is always based on experience. So that's what the empiricists are going to say. The rationalist knowledge is based on reason. The empiricist based on experience. You know, Hume is famously says, if you've never seen the color red in your entire life, let's say you're blind from birth, you've never seen red, you wouldn't know what the, you wouldn't have a concept of red. You wouldn't know what red looks like. The only reason you know what red looks like is because you've seen the color red. You know, you know, it, you know so we can all close our eyes and picture red, you know. Uh, but if we have, if we're blind from birth, could we do that? Hume says no, right? Always starts it's with like, all you see is black. Um, what right, I, I'm guessing, I, I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, if you're blind from birth, I guess you'd probably hear the word red all the time. You'd hear people talking about colors, but you'd have no way to really understand what they're talking about, you know? It's like, you know, imagine you, imagine you, you never had an avocado in your whole entire life. Uh, or you, I'm assuming most of us have had avocado or guacamole or something like this, right? Imagine you met no. somebody. No, you haven't? Oh, geez. Well, could somebody explain to her what it tastes like? 
I don't think you can, right? It's, it's, it tastes like earth, <laughs> says Kalik. Mush. Well, mush is more like its texture. I don't know that's really the flavor. It's, it really has a unique flavor. So, you know, for humans, like all of us, whether you like it or not, you might dislike the flavor, you might like the flavor. That's a, that is your opinion. That's t your taste. But you know what it tastes like. Whether you, whether, whether you like it or you dislike it, you can picture it in your mind. But if you've never tasted it, you never had it before, you don't have that knowledge. You don't have that, 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 that you know, idea. So, so those are the two approaches to, to uh, epistemology. There's others, right? We'll get to Kant uh, a little bit later. He's kind of in the middle. You know? He sort of wants to say, well, you need reason and you need experience. And they're both kind of right, but they're also wrong in certain respects. So you know, it's a little bit complicated. Um, but this, in, in short, is some of the main things that the modern philosophers focus on. This is sort of one of the main focuses, uh, and this is what we're going to really look at, is these, these sort of questions. What led to this, though? Like, why, why the shift? Why the shift away from metaphysics to epistemology? Um, well, this leads us into the topic, the main topic today, uh, is the scientific revolution. So Descartes, uh, as I said, he's, you know, he's considered the father of modern philosophy and modern philosophy is seen to have been born of the scientific revolution. He's living during this time period. So, so Descartes lives to see the works of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, many of the other greats. Uh, we're only going to go over these three because they're kind of the big three. Uh, but Descartes lives through all this change. He lives through all of these historical changes. And so because of all these new scientific discoveries about the world around us uh, and about the, the planets and all this, uh, philosophy has to rethink a lot. And so this is one of the main reasons we get a shift uh, away from... What about the asteroid? Does it have some... Like, what about the asteroid? Um, what about... What asteroid? They say it's supposed to like somehow hit Earth or something like that. I'm not sure what asteroid you're referring to. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. I mean, there. I mean, I'm sure there was like some maybe some event, but I I don't know how what that has to do with the scientific revolution. Um, I I could be wrong, but but what what are some things? Does anybody know what are some like what are some things about the scientific revolution? Um that changed the way that people saw our universe? What are some things that, like for instance, what are some things that we believe now about the universe that we didn't believe back then? Like what has changed about some of our, our scientific beliefs before? Like the discovery of different planets in the universe and what it looks like outside the solar well, that, system and well, that's, galaxy. That's true. Like we have discovered more planets, but um, before the scientific revolution, they would constantly discover more planets. You know, I mean, not as many as we because we didn't have as good technology. I mean, I mean we, we have way better technology, so we can discover more planets at a higher rate. Galaxy. What's that? I mean, like galaxy. Right. Yeah. Well, and what led to that though? You're skipping a lot of steps, right? The the the, the concept of a galaxy. The concept of like you know a solar system that came way towards the end of the scientific revolution and there were some other discoveries that that led the, led the way to that stuff i mean you're right that is a part of it but that wasn't really like that wasn't a big major like flip uh i'm looking at like the chat box here uh someone says earth but what about the earth the shape of the earth? No, actually, that's a popular that's a popular mi misconception. Oh, they was talking about how the guacamole tastes. Oh, how the oh oh that's right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's what it was responding to. But yeah, the shape of the earth. Somebody puts a shape of the earth. Uh, that actually is is. I I see why you think that, but honestly, uh, most people who were very educated, they knew the earth was round. They've been misleading you all this time, telling you that, dis that that Columbus discovered that the world was not flat, you know, that the earth was round. The Greeks knew the world was round a long time ago. And even Thales, uh, one of these early Greek philosophers, was able to measure the circumference of the earth. I mean, most, you know, if you weren't very educated, you were like just a peasant and, you know, some of them thought the world was flat, perhaps. It wasn't until after America was discovered that they were like, oh, I guess it's right, you know. 
But most educated and most sailors, if you were a sailor who was a seafaring person, you knew the world was not flat. So that's actually a popular misconception. Uh, but what about the world, though? What about the world and where it was located? What did people think about the Earth, you know, our planet, and where it was located in the universe? What was its position in relation to everything else? Uh, Kalik's got it. He's, uh, it uh, it's, uh, they thought that the Earth was at the center. Good, right? So um, Copernicus, he is the person who... And in fact, sometimes you'll hear historians talk about the Copernican revolution, not the scientific revolution. They'll, they'll name it after him because he's the first to introduce the notion of a heliocentric model. So he thought, well, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe Earth is not at the center, you know, and maybe Earth's even moving. That was another thing. He thought Earth was moving. It was rotating and orbiting. Uh, and that the sun perhaps was at the center. That's that's the heliocentric model, you know. So again, before that, you had uh, the the basic belief. You know, you had this this what's called the to, uh, Ptolemaic model. It's named after this uh, Roman astronomer Ptolemy. And you know, he was basing all this stuff off of the Greeks. You know, it goes back to Aristotle, even Plato. They all thought Earth's in the center and it's fixed at the center of the universe and all the other planets and the stars, you know, and the sun and the you know, moon, they all orbit around the earth and they're all moving in perfect circles around the earth, perfect circular motions. And they don't change their velocity. They don't speed up or slow down. They remain at a constant speed. So they all believed this. And it was based on a lot of arguments, on observations. Some of these arguments were pretty questionable. You look to people like Aristotle and some of the reasons why they thought that the planets moved in perfect circles uh, was because the planets were divine. You know, there are these huge, whatever, massive things up in the heavens and they float around. They must be divine. Was, was sort of the thinking. They're godlike if they're not gods themselves. And so gods are perfect and circles are perfect, I guess. So, I mean, I'm not going to go over the argument, but apparently the, the circle is a perfect shape. So all the planets move in perfect circles because they're perfect, they're divine, <clears throat> and they don't change their speed. They're always moving at the same rate. Why would they change speed? If they're divine and they're perfect, why would you change anything? Don't change anything if you're perfect. And also they were smooth. That was the belief. They were smooth, perfect, beautiful orbs. They were, per you know, were always the same distance from Earth. But that was a very bad model. I mean, it worked to a certain extent, but when you got to trying to predict things with the absolute accuracy, you'd always be off and sometimes you'd be way off. You know, imagine you're here on earth and you're looking up at the moon and you're assuming all that stuff I just said is true. You're assuming that everything up there is moving in a perfect circle. We're, we're fixed. Earth's not spinning on its axis, not orbiting anything. Earth is fixed at the center and all that stuff up there is, is always the same distance from earth. It's always the same distance. It's always moving at the same speed. Okay, so you assume all this is true because darn it, Aristotle, that guy's a genius. I mean, Aristotle, it can't be understated. That guy was, for like 2,000 years, he was the man. Everybody thought that, you know, his biology, his physics, his ethics, like pretty much everything, um, except for his religion. You know, I think the Christians and the Muslims took a little bit from that. But, you know, besides that, yeah, that but, but anything else, all, all what, you, what you might call science was based on these Aristotelian assumptions, what Aristotle had put forth. But of course, they didn't work quite well. So they developed a little bit more complicated systems, but they, they wouldn't budge on these basic things, right? We're in the middle. Everything's moving in perfect circles around us, and it's moving at the same speed. They wouldn't give that up. So Ptolemy, he's the one that comes up with this idea of epicycles. Because, you know, if you, again, if you're, on, if you're on Earth and, you, you know, you go out, at night and you look up at the sky and you look at the moon 
and you say, well, look, the moon's there tonight. And you go and you wait a night, you go the next night and then you look and now it's like, you know, four clicks, uh, you know, to the east or whatever. So you're like, okay, four clicks per night. All right. So, you know, in 30 days, uh, it'll be uh, over here and you predict where it'll be. So you wait 30 days, you go outside, you look up and it's nowhere near that. It's like on the other side of you, behind your shoulder, right? So they thought, well, you know what? Maybe there's what are called epicycles. The Tol T uh, Ptolemaic model is kind of based on this. So maybe every once in a while, you know, like Venus here, you see, every once in a while, as it's orbiting around the Earth, it'll pause and do a little loop-de-loop, -loop, a little loop, and then every, you know, every like 30 days or every four months, it does a loop-de-loop, -loop, comes off its main path and loops back. Okay. And this got really complicated. You know, they started adding cycles within cycles and all this stuff, and it still wasn't absolutely accurate. So when you get to Copernicus and the introduction of the heliocentric model, we're starting to make a lot of real progress, right? The sun is now in the middle, and the planets and Earth and the moon and all that stuff revolves around the Earth. But what else is wrong with this picture? What else is wrong with the Ptolemaic model? So we've already kind of fixed the Earth being you know, in the center, we got to put the sun in the center now. So what, but what else, what other assumptions are wrong about all that stuff I just said? Not only is the earth not in the center, but what else about this picture? It's like the sun is where earth is supposed to be. Right, that's what we've already established. I'm asking what next, what else do we need to improve? So let's, again, you know, we're going to have the sun in the cycles. middle. What's that? I think you got the it. Epicycles. Well, the epicycles. Well, you, you got to get rid of the epicycles, but if you get rid of the epicycles, then you still have, do, do the planets move in perfect circles around the sun? No, they move in like ovals. Yeah, elliptical orbits, like ovals, exactly. So that would be Kepler, okay? So Kepler, he, Johannes Kepler, He's the first astronomer to propose that, okay, not only um, is the sun in the middle, but the planets do not move in perfect circles. They move in an elliptical way, you know, an oval, okay? And, and also, and, and he usually gets more attention for that, but he also thought that the planets move faster and slower at certain parts of their orbit. When they get further away from the sun, they change their speed and they come back around, they speed up. And he even, de he even developed, um, if you ever take a class in astronomy, you'll learn Kepler's law. And he, he figured out this formula so he could figure out how fast a planet was going depending on where it was located in its orbit. Okay. So, so Kepler, you know, he's got the elliptical orbits, Copernicus, heliocentric. We're making really good progress. Uh, things are starting to look, make a lot more sense. Our predictions about the night sky are much more accurate. Um, now, Galileo comes along, and he's probably the one that most of you have heard of, but what is he known for? What's Galileo famous for? He's, he's usually given credit for some, inventing something that I don't think he really technically invented, uh, but what, what is Galileo known? He's known for a lot of things. Somebody asked, the telescope? Yes, you are correct. Okay. So, yeah, he's usually, people will call him this. He invented the telescope. I don't think, he's actually the first to um, patent the telescope. Uh, and so he started, I guess he's the first to make money off of it. But to be fair, he, he improved it so much. He made it so much better that I, I think before it was pretty weak. I, mean, I, think, I think he, he, he magnified things up to 20 degree or 20 times or 40 times or something. So he more than quadrupled the effectiveness of a telescope and he made money off of it. And somebody said, is he the father of physics? In a sense, kind of, um, you might say that Newton really, Sir Isaac Newton is the father of modern physics, but, um, Galileo certainly paved the way for modern physics. And in fact, uh, Kepler isn't as well. There, isn't there uh, Galileo's uh, 
telescope still in existence somewhere in a museum? Is that true? Is Galileo what? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. Is Galileo's telescope, ain't, didn't they say it's still here? Like, it still exists? What still exists? His telescope. His telescope? I'm not sure. I'm sure that some museum somewhere has a copy of his telescope. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I probably, you know, look it up. Galileo's telescope. I'm sure you'll find something on Wikipedia or something like that. I'm getting sidetracked, though. You, I'm sorry. Your questions are very, your questions are kind of distracting today, Danielle. I don't know. I'm sorry, but um, just uh, let's see here. What were we talking about? Oh yeah, somebody asked about him being the father of physics. Okay, and I wanted to sort of say he kind of is, but he kind of isn't. Uh, and this is this is maybe true of Kepler as well, because Ke Kepler was um, um, not only known for this idea that the planets moved in elliptical orbits, but he had this different version of gravity, right? Aristotle thought that gravity, the reason that things fall uh, for Aristotle is because, well, we're in the middle. Earth is in the middle. So all the heavy stuff, everything that has weight and it's heavy, tries to get to the center, tries to fall, to, to the clumps to the middle of the universe. And everything that's light, like air and fire, moves away, moves out to the edges of the universe. And so that was sort of how gravity was explained. But Kepler and Galileo argued, and this is, and Newton sort of sealed the deal. That's why he's kind of, I guess, the father of modern physics. Uh, but they argued, no, no, gravity is something that all bodies have gravitational force and pull on each other. And so, and that's part of why Kepler thought the planets would speed up and slow down, depending on how close they were to the sun you know, because the sun had a gravitational pull. You might have been told the story when, you know, in, in, you know, in science class about how uh, Galileo, he tried to prove that, um, you know, a feather in a bowling ball would fall at the same speed. He got the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and he tried to show that they fall at the same, because Aristotle assumed that if something's heavier, it's going to fall faster. Uh, and be, because it's going to the center of the earth that has more force and more weight, it's going to fall faster. And Galileo thought that that's not true. He thought everything will fall at the same rate, um, the same speed, 9.8 meters squared is now what we know it to be. If you take class in physics, you'll know that. He says that heavy things only fall uh, faster because there's less resistance. In a vacuum, they would all, he, he was thought to be crazy though even though people take this for granted, right? Newton's law, everything, in, you know, it's going to you know, be in motion, stays in motion, act upon, all that stuff's based upon, um, you know, the work of <clears throat> Galileo, Kepler, Copernicus. And Galileo, he paid a cost for his discoveries, his, his science, whereas you can say Kepler and Copernicus kind of got away uh, they developed some pretty controversial views, but um, they didn't publish them until they were like on their deathbed. So um, Galileo got in a lot of trouble for publishing this stuff. Why? Why do you think he got in all this trouble? Uh, why the church got really mad at Galileo? He got excommunicated. That means he was kicked out of the church. Uh, you know, his, his his soul was damned to eternity. Uh, unless he recanted his views about the sun being in the center and the planets not moving. And, and also when, you know, when he used a telescope to look at the planets, um, he, he didn't, he expected to see these perfect orbs, these perfectly smooth, beautiful, divine. And they were, you know, there's craters all over the moon. It looked ugly. It was like a desert, but he wasn't shy about this. He published all his findings. He got in a lot of trouble for this. Why did he get in trouble for that, though? Why, why, did, why do you think the church was so upset with him telling everybody that the sun was in the center and that the planets did not move in perfect circles? And, like, because like, it was a dangerous idea because it meant that humans weren't at the center of things after all. So they, because they believed that we were the center of everything. So good. Then, yeah, good. I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the, I think that's what, big reason is, and it's not, I mean, really, I think the reason the church uh, jumped against this was because it was threatening their authority. You know, the, uh, science and religion 
basically up until the scientific revolution, up until that point, science and religion were, were the same thing. They were seen as the same thing, right? It, most scientists, at least in Europe, you know, in Western Europe, you know, if, if you were doing science, you were always, you were always doing it within, within the context of the church. And, you know, God created nature. So if you're studying nature, you're studying God. That was sort of the reasoning. Uh, with people like Descartes, we start to get a uh, separation of those two things. And so I think Galileo is seen as a threat to the church's authority. And the church had spent, I mean, it, all these really great philosophers like St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, they had spent centuries taking all the early Greek philosophy, uh, especially like Aquinas with, 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 uh, with uh, Aristotle. He had taken all the teachings of Aristotle, which were thought to be the best teachings about biology, physics, everything you needed to know about the universe pretty much was based on Aristotle. And Aquinas spent his whole life interpreting Aristotle, interpreting the Bible, and see, showing how they fit together. How all the truth that Aristotle revealed through his science was also revealed in the scriptures. And so you also have to understand that during the medieval period, the church was one of the most, like, I guess, stable authorities in Europe. I mean, the Dark Ages, they don't call it the Dark Ages for no reason. The, the plague was going on. There were a lot of wars. Europe was not a pretty place to live during the medieval period. You know, during the 1100s, 1200s, or, yeah, it was not a pretty place to live. And the church gave hope. It gave stability. It was a bedrock. You had all these wars. You had one king overthrowing another king, death, destruction, pestilence, you name it. But the church was always there to give you answers. And as, as Rev puts it, it gave us a sense of purpose. We're in the middle. We're significant, right? God created the universe and put us in the middle. So we must be somehow kind of special. But now we're not so special. We've been kind of cosmically demoted. And, uh, you know, now we're not even sure where the center is. And all those stars might even be other suns. And there's other galaxies, like, like Danielle was saying earlier, and other planets, etc. cetera. Um, and so, yeah, like Rev was saying, yeah, we, we're, we're sort of not so special anymore. The, the universe is much more vast, and we seem a little bit more insignificant because of that. And again, back to my earlier point, what I was saying, uh, the church is feeling threatened by this. You know, they're, they're, they excommunicate Galileo. They kick him out uh, of the church. Um, so, um, you know, there's not just... The scientists or the scientifically minded, there aren't just these, these individuals here who are posing a problem for the church during this time period. Uh, there are also, I guess, people that are more focused on spiritual matters who also start to stand up against the church. Uh, so I've listed three of, I guess, the main figures in the scientific revolution, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo. Um, but what else was going on during this time period? Can anybody tell me around the year 1600, uh, there was another, I guess you might say, challenge to the church for different reasons. You know, these guys were challenging the church's teachings about astronomy, about the planets, about all that. But there was also another challenge going on. Uh, there was a gentleman, uh, I use that term loosely here. Uh, there was an individual man, very interesting man, powerful, I guess, strong character, a uh, guy with a very strong character, who opposed the church uh, for other reasons. But he was a very religious man. He was very devout, but he didn't like what the church was teaching. And one morning he, he went up to the, the church in Württemberg and he, he nailed um, – a bunch of a list of a bunch of things that he thought the church was teaching that were confusing that he didn't really find evidence for in the Bible itself, and he got in a lot of trouble for this. Does anybody know who I'm talking to? Uh, who I'm talking about here? Who I'm referring to? Who was this guy? He started the whole Protestant uh, revolution. At least he's given credit for it. It was probably a lot more to it than just him, but. Nobody knows who I'm talking about. He wrote the 95 Theses, went up and, and nailed them on the church door, got excommunicated, started a whole split in the church between the Catholics and the Protestants. 
Nobody knows this. Let me see. There's, well, I guess there's not a lot of people here. There's like, I guess it's not much of a turnout today. Only 18 people showed up. That's pretty sad still. Out of 18 people, nobody knows who I'm talking about. Yes, somebody does. Yay, someone knows. <laughs> uh, Luther, yes, you are correct. Uh, Martin Luther is the one I'm referring to. Okay. Do you, do you know what was he uh, angry about? What were what was some of the problems that he um, he was having with the church? Like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know all ninety five. So if you ask me for all 95, I couldn't come up with every one of them. But uh, someone says, not really. Uh, so yeah, uh, Jemiah, not really. I think it was something about taking money. Yeah, it was. Who was taking money? And, and, for, and, and for what? Why? So the, the, the church, yes, the church were taking money. But don't, doesn't the church take money still? Like every church takes, like, they pass out the jar. For sins, yes, good, right. So you would basically buy your way into heaven. Exactly, you got it. Rev's got it. So <clears throat> that was one thing. They called them indulgences. That was the name of that practice. The, the church would go around and you would pay your way into heaven, basically. And and they would even, um, you know, like uh, let's say one of your relatives passed away. They would even, at, you know, they would come to your door after, you know, maybe wait a few months and wait till you'd been done grieving and then they'd be like, hey, you know, your cousin, they were being really naughty on that day they died. So they're probably in purgatory right now. But, you know, if you give us some money, we'll talk to the Pope and the Pope will talk to God and, you know, we'll get you into heaven or we'll get your cousin into heaven sooner. Right. So, yeah, he did not approve of that practice. Luther was like, where is this? I don't see this in scripture. Um, anybody know any other reasons, other things that he didn't like about the church? And the things they were practicing. What uh, what was the uh, who was allowed to um, read the Bible before the Protestant re uh, Revolution? Who was allowed to read the Bible? Scholars. Yeah, you're kind of right. But who were scholars? If you were a scholar in Europe during the medieval period. Where were you studying? They didn't have universities. That doesn't come till like much later. The church, that's right. Okay, so only priests could read the Bible. If you were like a shopkeeper or a merchant, um, most peasants couldn't read. They were illiterate. But if like, let's say you owned a shop and you knew how to write and read, you weren't supposed to read the Bible unless you were gonna become a priest. You know, if you're a rich king, even, you're not, you're not supposed to. Some of the kings did. They weren't supposed to read the Bible. Why not? Why can't someone read the Bible? What's wrong with someone reading the Bible? What was their, their reasoning? No one knows what they were telling people. You know, if you're if you're if you're like a pretty rich like royalty and you're like I want to read that Bible and some priest says no you can't my your 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 highness you're like why not you know I, I demand an answer what kind of answer do you think the priest would give you I can't let you read that for your own good uh someone is trying to get in the meeting they lost service I don't see anybody okay I do now I see him okay I, I just let him in. They weren't worthy, kind of. They were nicer about it than that. They weren't like, you're not worthy of reading the Bible. But they would explain, like, um, what would happen if you read? Is is there is it possible to interpret the Bible in different ways? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you better believe it. <laughs> you better believe it. So, the, but but the church has the right reading they have the right interpretation okay so what if you read it without the guidance of the church you might misinterpret it and what would happen if you misinterpreted it then you would believe the wrong thing and if you believe the wrong thing then what would happen to you in your soul 
Well, you would go to hell. Right, exactly. So you don't want to go to hell. So you better just just trust us. We'll read it for you, and we'll tell you what it means. Uh, and what language? That's whack, Allison says. Yeah, it kind of was whack. It's pretty slick, though, isn't it? It's pretty slick little setup they got there, right? We'll tell you what it means. Just trust us. Yeah. Uh, what language did they did they read it in? You were only allowed to read it and and speak it and in a service in in a one language. What was the language? You probably just guess. You, you know, what was the language of scholars? Yes, Latin. You're correct. Does do you know the story though behind that? Was the Bible written in Latin? Was the original Bible written in Latin? You, does anyone know the answer to that? Or you, you don't know what it was written in? The original, the original scripture, what language? The, like, no one knows that? Well, the, the, old, the old Testament, the old, what you call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, uh, the Torah, uh, you know, and plus the other books of wisdom, that was all in Hebrew, okay? Mostly Hebrew and some Aramaic and other slang. The New Testament's Greek, right? The New Testament's mainly, it's all Greek. Uh, so why Latin? Why was Latin the official version? The church said, no, you can't, you can't translate it into German. That's one thing Luther, he wanted to translate into German and he wanted to let anybody read it. Anybody wants to read it, they should be able to read it. And, and he translated, the, he was the first to translate the Bible into a common language that everybody could read. Um, but uh, no one knows the story about the, the why Latin was seen as the right version. Well, the story, the church, uh, and, and this is, I think they still teach it today. The Latin Vulgate uh, was thought to be a miracle translation. So because Latin was the language of scholars, St. Jerome, he's an early, early church father. He was a scribe. I think it's St. Jerome. Um, I could be off on the saint, but I, he was early church father. He sat down and he translated the original Greek and the original Hebrew to Latin. And he had, I think, 60, 70, 80, depending on what story you listen to. I think some of them had like 400 scribes. They, they all sat around independently. They're all at their own little desks and they're all translating the Bible from the original to Latin. And when they were all done, they sat and they compared each other's um, uh, translations and apparently they were all exactly the same and so it was seen as a miracle translation uh, and so it was it was the translation was guided by the hand of God and so it was even more accurate than the original it was even more true than the original that was the teaching of the church um, and for a long time even the church would you know it wasn't until I guess 1962 that the Catholic Church allowed mass to be done in non-Latin you could you could say mass in other languages so it was this was it kept up for a while right so um oh you're someone Kalik is asking about the you're probably referring to the nicene creed um yeah that, that that's 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 a quite a while ago right that's the nicene creed is is that's when um uh Constantine, the emperor, uh, declares Christianity one of the state religions, uh, and that's much earlier, right? That's like fifth century, and so that's this is much later, right? So the the church has been dominant in Europe for hundreds of years uh, when these guys show up, okay? But yes, yeah, so what you're talking about, the Nicene Creed, uh, is, is is earlier. But what I'm talking about is even earlier than that. I think like St. Jerome, uh, he translated the Latin Vulgate, I think in the year 300. I could be wrong. My dates could be backwards. I, I I'm on, honestly don't know, but I'm pretty sure that the translation happened and then the Nicene Creed happened after. Um, but it doesn't actually make sense though, because I think part of the Nicene Creed was establishing the canon. They decided what books got got included in the Bible and which books got thrown out. Uh, and so maybe it was Jerome came after, but I, I don't think so. I think Jerome's like early. He's like years 200, 300, 
something like that. But I digress. It's an inter interesting, just look it up, right? I'm sure there's tons of information out there uh, on the internet. But um, so basically the point I'm making about all this stuff is you've got all these challenges to the church, right? That the priest's authority, you couldn't even pray, right? You weren't even allowed to pray. You, you know, only the priest could, could talk to, the, to God for you. They were trained how to pray. So a lot of this stuff, uh, Luther challenges, you know, and he, you know, he goes into the church one morning and he, he, he nails his, you know, list of questions and he gets kicked out of the church, but all the royalty backs him up in Germany. And so he's able to sort of, you know, survive and he starts Protestantism basically. And it's just all these other offshoots. So but back, back to philosophy right now, now you might see why uh, these guys have to rethink things. Wait a minute. Uh, we don't even know what's going on. We used to think that Earth's in the center, and now we don't even know where the center is, or if there is a center to the universe. Uh, and so we've got to kind of start all over. And this is where Descartes is coming from. And now the focus is on knowledge, right? We, we, we just took for granted all of these things to be true, that Earth's in the center, that all the planets, they're perfectly circular, moving in perfect circles. All this stuff seemed right and seemed intuitive and was completely wrong so we've got to kind of go back to the drawing board and we have to make sure that whatever principles that we're going to base our philosophy and our science on have to be certain and they have to be good because we don't want to be like you know poor ptolemy you know imagine how much work that ptolemy put into this model how how, how many nights he stayed awake looking at the night sky uh trying to you know figure out how many epicycles mars had when it had it and now we just look at this and laugh well how cute you know he thought that the earth was in the center descartes and these philosophers and the new scientists they don't want to fall prey to the same mistake. So before they proceed, they want to make sure the method they use to conduct their science is a good method, it's a reliable method, and it's not going to lead to these erroneous conclusions uh, that they were stuck in for centuries. So that's really all I wanted to say today uh, about the scientific revolution and kind of setting things up for uh for next class so we can jump right into the reading and jump right into descartes but we've got about 20 minutes to kill if you'd like to leave you're free to go right class is dismissed you can leave early uh but i'll stick around i'm just gonna sit here and kind of drink my water um i'll go ahead and stop the recording uh that'll be the end of the lecture